Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Well, it is 3.34 a.m. <laughs> on this Monday evening. And I've been driving around for like the last hour listening to my audiobook. I still have not finished uh, my friend Anna. So I'm listening to it. If we had done the book um, club live stream on Sunday, if Mel had been able to do it, I would have had the powerhouse through this book. So I've been listening to it a little bit here and there. It's just really, I have to say, just not super interesting to me. I thought it would be really, really interesting, but it's just, it's not that interesting to me. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I know some people really liked it and uh, thought it was great, but I'm just kind of bored by it. Plus, there's a lot of books that I want to read this month that are like spooky and scary for Halloween. And I'm just, this is kind of not the book that I'm in the mood to read. So, today was a good day. Um, I think I'm actually going to turn around and go to McDonald's and get a Diet Coke. Um, I got up today. I still have my coffee cup in here from yesterday. I got up today and, God, it seems like it's, today was a long day. What did I do? Um, I'm like thinking back on my day. Okay, so I got up today and um, I had this like sobriety commitment early in the evening. So I had to run all these errands and get everything done that I wanted to get done earlier. Um, I got up and let the dogs out and did all that kind of stuff. And then I went and got my coffee and ran a couple errands. And um, what else did I do? And then I came home and I cleaned up a little bit <clears throat> around the house. And then I made two videos for my drama channel. And I did a review video. And then I started getting that stuff up. Oh, this is what happened. My vlog, you guys. Okay, so my vlog, this is why it went up really, really late yesterday. Um, so my vlog was like an hour and 22 minutes or something like that, right? And I, um, like I rendered it and I noticed that it didn't take me lo that long to render. Like it usually takes, like if it's over an hour, it usually takes me like a half an hour to render, right? Well, it was done in like 10 minutes. And I thought, that's kind of weird. And then I started uploading it um, to YouTube when I left. And um, when I came back, it was, it usually, it can sometimes take the vlog, depending on how long it is, it can sometimes take up to like two hours to upload, which I know sounds like a really long time, but if it's over an hour, you know, it takes a long time sometimes. And so um, I came back and it was like, all done and everything. I think I actually, I checked while I was gone and it was like, within like an hour, it was like uploaded and I thought, that's weird. And so I came home and I was like getting ready to film my videos and um, why is my nose itching? I trimmed my beard the other day. I think it's probably because of that. Um, I noticed it was like ready to go and stuff and so I was like, you know, adding the description and all that kind of stuff and getting ready to upload it. And I went in and I pressed play and it said that it was 36 minutes long. And I was like, what, what is going on here? Well, when I had been rendering it earlier, it had said like this, like note, like this, you know, like notification that came up on my computer, computer and said that there wasn't enough room for this project or something like that. It was different than like the usual notifications I got because it was like an iMovie notification. So I, um, just let it happen anyway and I went through and I like deleted like the saved stuff that I had and um so then I was like okay obviously this it didn't like render the whole movie you know like the whole the whole movie the whole video so I went back in and I was like trying to figure it out and I could not figure out what I did wrong and then I got into um iMovie and in the library at iMovie it literally had every clip 
from every vlog that I've done for like the last two months. And I was like, oh, like, and every video that I've made for like the last two months, like every clip was in my, like my iMovie library. And I was, I'd probably since I bought the computer, and I was like, oh, well, this would make sense as to why there's not enough room on there, because it has literally every single clip that I've ever filmed and put on iMovie in there, in the library. And I always go in and delete them, so I don't know why it was still in there. But anyway, so I went through, and I was, like, deleting all of them, but I was afraid to delete um, the clips that I had of my vlog. Well, imagine how many clips I have of me in a... In a black t-shirt and a hat driving in a car. I mean, like, hundreds, right? Because that's my vlog, like, every single night. So, I wasn't sure which, like, five clips were from my vlog last night, so I couldn't delete all the, It just, it was a mess, and so it wouldn't let me keep on doing that, and I had already deleted off my memory card to start filming um, my other videos, so I didn't have the actual clips on the memory card that I could just go in there and redo it, or it would have been a lot easier, so I had to go in there and find them all. Oh, <sighs> All for the vlog. So anyway, um, but I got it all figured out, and but then I, I wanted to get my other videos up, and so I was like, well, I'll wait to finish my vlog when I get home from my sobriety thing, and but I didn't know what time I would get home. I didn't know if it would be like a, a half an hour or an hour or like what. It wasn't just like me going to a meeting. So anyway, I um. So I went and did that, I got changed, and I went and did that, and then I got my other videos up, and I came home, and Alex was home by that point, and um, so he was doing some stuff around the house, and so we were, I was like hanging out there, he was like going through some clothes and stuff in the bedroom, and I was just like sitting there talking to him while he was doing that, and hanging out with the dogs and stuff, so we hung out for a while, and then he had got stuff to make a salad. And so he was like, I'm gonna go downstairs and make the salad now. Are you hungry? And I was like, no, I'm not really that hungry. And so um, he was like, okay. He was like, well, I'm, I wanted to watch some TV. And I was like, I'm kind of tired. I don't really care. Um, what, Cause he was like, do you care if I watch the, like my TV shows catch up on him? I was like, no, I'm kind of tired, honestly. And, um, Oh, I do. I have a dime. And he was like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I think I'm going to sit here for a second and watch this documentary that I've been wanting to watch. Because I've been wanting to watch this documentary on oxygen that people told me about. And it was called Method of a Serial Killer about Israel Keys. It's pretty much basically the book that I read, that American Predator book. Um, but it has actual footage of him and, like, his video interviews and things like that. Like, you can, or audio interviews with the FBI. You can hear them. Hello, welcome to McDonald's with you. Can I get a large Diet Coke, please? So, I was watching that while he... How did I just lose my dime? My dime? Are you kidding me? So, I was watching that while he... I was, like, sitting in the chair, and he was, like, on the couch. And then my friend Valerini called, and I caught up with Valerini. Hold on. How are you doing? Good. What's trick treat win? Huh? What's trick treat win? I don't know. They just gave us the shirt. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. I thought it was like something to, you know, you can like pull tabs like those McDonald's. Do they still do the McDonald's games? My friend Melissa is obsessed with those McDonald's games at, um, at McDonald's. Oh, thank you. Have a good one. My friend Melissa is obsessed with those, um, Monopoly games at McDonald's. I don't know why she never wins anything. <laughs> I've never known anybody that has, like, won anything, any big deal. But, when the last time that she played it, she would call me and she'd say, okay, now these are the ones that I need, so if you get these, you need to, uh, give them to me. So anyway, I watched about a half an hour of that, and then I got so tired watching that, um, 
thing. And I've been trying to listen to my friend Anna all day today. Oh man, somebody's got somewhere to go. I've been trying to listen to my friend Anna all day today because I was like, I'm wanting to get it done so that I can go on and I want to read Now Entering Adamsville by Francesca Zappia. Like, I really want to read that. And Raven Boys uh, by, why can't I think of her name? Maggie Steve Otter. And there's like four books that I want to read this, like definitely want to read this month, plus the book club book, The Iceman, which I think looks really good. And um, so yeah. So I went upstairs and I lay down with Boo Radley. So this is now how it happens, right? First of all, let me just tell you this bedding that we got is so fantastic. It's so nice. That car is in a hurry. Our bedding looks so nice. And um, it's so comfy. It's gonna be great for winter. And the dogs love it, and I love it, and Alex loves it. And so, <laughs> it's so cute. Boo Radley takes naps with me like every night when I lay down. So I was like in bed, and I was like, Alex was watching the Kardashians, and I yelled at him. I was like, is Boo Radley down there? And he was like, yeah. And I go, Boo Radley, I'm taking a nap. He, they know the word nap now. Whenever I say nap, they come running upstairs. So I said, is he still down there? And he goes, he's coming upstairs right now. Call him again. And I go, Boo Radley. And then all of a sudden he just like, I was like looking his head popped up at the top of the stairs. And so he jumped up and Alex was like, I don't want him sleeping on my pillow. And I was like, okay. So he came up on the bed and he got all situated in this little circle. He gets like real tight in a little circle. And then like I'm laying there and I'm like falling asleep and I'm so comfortable. I had the fan like on super high. I had it like on the, like we have this like wind tunnel machine. And I had it on super high, it was like the middle one. It's like, like when it's really going. And um, Boo Rattle was there and I was almost asleep and I heard, That's Pee Pee saying, let me up on the bed, right? And he goes like this on his little toes or his little feet or paws or whatever. And he's like, and he comes over to the edge of the bed. But I can't just like, he will only get on the bed at the end of the bed because that's how he knows how to get up on the bed. We're so far past him jumping on the bed. He cannot get on the bed by himself anymore. It's kind of sad. So anyway, and I've tried those like stairs and stuff and he just won't use them. So anyway, so I... I can't just lean over and pick him up. I have to like get out of the bed, go pick him up, put him on the bed and get back into bed. So then by that point I was like up again. I was like, oh my God. So he was real sweet. And then he came and I was like on my side facing the window and he came uh, against my leg and went to sleep and I just was so cozy. And then, um, I don't know how long I slept for. Alex came upstairs. He went to bed early and he was like, uh, he was like, no, don't sleep through the, he was like, can you turn your alarm off? Cause I had my alarm off. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, no, don't sleep through the night. He was like, cause you gotta do your vlog and stuff. I need to start just vlogging throughout the day and going to bed early. Cause I've been going to bed early lately. And I think like San Diego changed that for me because when we were in San Diego, I would go to bed between 1230 and one and then we would, I would sleep till like not between nine and 10 and I was so rested and it just was so fantastic. And it was really nice getting like a long amount of sleep. But I think I just need to be vlogging throughout the day and then um, going to bed early. Is I need to start doing that more um, and getting like a full night's sleep. Cause I just, even though I don't necessarily feel 100% more productive, it, I, like, I just feel more focused and, you know, happier and whatever. So I need to do that. But, so there's that. And then, um, I woke up at about, I don't know what time it was, like 1230 or one. And I was like, just like looking at stuff on my computer, like went downstairs and, I was like looking through my writing stuff because I've been like writing a little bit. And so I was looking through and I was kind of like taking notes of what I want to work on and stuff like that. I took the dogs outside, let Pee Pee finish his dinner because he won't eat his dinner all at once. And I have to kind of watch because if I don't, Boo and Tucker will come and eat his dinner. 
So I was making sure that he was like sitting there eating it in the kitchen and they weren't bothering him. And then I left to go vlog. I got them all back situated in to go to sleep and then I left to came vlog. And that was, come to, I left to come out and go vlog. And then I like got in my car and I was like listening. I like was like, okay, I'm gonna get just into the groove by listening to this book for a little bit. And then I listened to like an hour of it, hour and a half of it maybe, I don't know. No, like an hour. I'm almost at like the halfway mark of the book. I mean, I'm dragging my feet in it. I was thinking to myself earlier today, I was like, if I listened to this book, like back in the day, I was thinking about this with like the Paula um, Hawkins books. You know what? I was wanting to look that up today to see if Paula Hawkins has a new book coming out. Paula Hawkins is the one that wrote Girl on the Train and Into the Water. Her books are so good. Um, her thrillers. But I was remembering like listening to Girl on the Train. And Girl on the Train was one of the very first thrillers the last couple years that like I really got back into thrillers again. And I can remember actually driving up here and listening to it and just like not wanting to go home because it was so good that I wanted to keep on finishing, reading it to finish it. And I would literally drive around for like three hours. When I was writing my book and I would take breaks from writing, I would go and listen to like two hours straight of an audiobook. Now I struggle listening to that long of it. But I was like, if I just listen to this, I could literally finish this book in one day. I mean, the whole book at two times speed is only, it's eight, it's eight hours and 47 minutes. So that's like two and a half hours. I mean, two and a half hours, four and a half hours. And if I just sat and listened to the whole thing, I'd have it done. I mean, now I'm halfway through. All I need to do is actually listen to it. Paula Hawkins' new book. Paula Hawkins, Into the Water, Girl on the Train. Does she not have a next book coming out? Her last book was 2017, it says. Yep. What is this? Untitled. Currently unavailable. Untitled. Okay, let's go to Goodreads and see what it says. I have 29 friend requests on Goodreads. I'll get to those here in a second. The new thriller. Published October 3rd, 2019. Well, that's not true. Cover to be revealed. The unmissable new thriller from the author of the global bestsellers, Girl on the Train and Into the Water. I wonder when her next book is coming out. Hmm. Who knows? Anyway... It's kind of toasty warm in here. And then tomorrow is my home group meeting with Tanya. And then we've been picking up our other friend. So I have to get up. I have to get Tanya early because our other friend lives about 20 minutes away. And, um,. But it's been fun. Three of us going to that. I was just thinking about there's this restaurant in Fishers where we sometimes go after meetings. We haven't gone in a long time, but it's called something pizza. It starts with a B. <laughs> I don't know why I can't think of it, but it starts with a P. It starts with a B. Something pizza. Tanya always gets like a fire roast. What's that called? A stone roasted pizza or whatever. But they have this like fettuccine there that they put on angel hair pasta and it has mushrooms in it. It is so good. 
and I was just like, oh my god, I wish we could go eat there tomorrow night. Why am I hungry right now? I wasn't hungry earlier. Now I am. That's ominous. A car parked on the side of the road over there with somebody like just outside standing up against it. I hope they're okay. Strange the things you see at night when you're driving around, you know? Oh my God, you guys. Okay, so somebody, I don't know who it is, probably somebody that watches my vlog, tagged, or they like sent me a message on Facebook. I just read it tonight. I just saw it tonight. That they, the guy, this guy wrote this book about Fox Hollow Farms and, um, you know, the Herb Baumeister killings. And it's apparently written by the guy that lives there, which I think is weird. Anyway, I mean, maybe not. I don't know. But it's apparently written by him, and he is doing a book reading at Barnes & Noble. I think it said October 25th um, in Carmel, Indiana. I'm thinking about going to this thing. I'm going to see if Melissa maybe wants to go. But somebody sent me that notice tonight. I was like, ooh, that's kind of spooky. But it is weird the things that you see when you're driving around at night. That you wouldn't, like, think about, you know? It's definitely... <laughs> this is including me. And I am aw fully aware of that. It is definitely a different crew of people that is up this late at night. I will tell you one of the things that's interesting to me is... Like, if I stop at the gas station to get something to drink or to go to the bathroom or whatever, like, how many people, like, at this time are up getting going to work for the next day? Like, they're going to the gym at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning and then going and taking showers and they're, like, they're going home and going to work or they're going to work at, like, you know, 4, 4.35 in the morning. Like, that is so crazy to me that people actually go to work that early. Who was I talking to the other day? I was talking to a friend of mine. God, who was I talking to? And I said, what time do you have to be at work? And she said, like, I usually, she goes, I'm up by four, getting my, like, lunch and stuff ready for the day, getting my outfit, like, you know, ready and doing my makeup. And she's like, and I'm usually at work by 5.30. I was like, what? <laughs> she's like, yeah, I'm usually at work by 5.30. I go, I, oh, my battery is dying. I do have another battery with me. I said, I am not even, like, asleep by that point. <laughs> She's like, that doesn't surprise me. This is somebody that's known me for a long time. And, um... Now I'm, like, totally remembering the whole conversation. But anyway, <laughs> she was like, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna pull over... I'm gonna pull over. Well, I'm almost to that gas station up here, so I'm gonna pull over there and uh, change the battery. I'll be back in just a second. Oh, and I'm at the end of 23 minutes. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. I'm actually in the parking lot behind the gas station. And I was looking up something. I was talking to this friend of mine that like met up with earlier tonight. We have to do this recovery thing together. She, we were talking about, like, podcasts. And she was telling me... Well, what was the one podcast that she watches? It actually sounded really good. It's, like, letters. It was, like, how was it made? Or, um... This is how it was made or something. Do you guys know the podcast I'm talking about? And they talk about, like, really bad movies. And... The whole the, the reason we had a conversation was because she had a t-shirt on that said, like, Team Fred. And, like, I said, where'd you get their t-shirt? And it was, like, it was a real cute t-shirt. And uh, she said, I got it from this podcast that I listened to. And I said, well, what's the podcast? And she said, it's, like, this podcast where they, like, have this panel discussion about... My nose is itching so bad for my beard. I don't know why. But she was like, it's this podcast that they have where... I need to just start driving because I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in a second. Okay, because we're going to go look up something. We're going to go on a little uh, wild goose hunt tonight. So, anyway, 
she said it's this podcast where like they talk about really bad movies and she was like but like when they did they did drop dead I guess they did the Fast and the Furious movies and um then they did Drop Dead Fred and she's like I love Drop Dead Fred it's one of my favorite movies and she was like so this the panel was split and then they sold these t-shirts like these she's like I never buy their merch but they sold these t-shirts and it was like they had these t-shirts that said Team Fred on them because of like the podcast discussion which I thought was kind of cute so we were talking about podcasts and she's like I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and I was like oh my god did you know and I was telling her about my book club and stuff like that and she didn't know about my book club, and um, so we were. We somehow we got talking about true crime, and I was telling her. I was like, um, "How did? How was it we got started talking about true crime?" Or how how was it we got started talking about this specific podcast? So she was telling me about like this murderer in Indianapolis, and she was like, "Oh, we drive by the house all the time of this murderer." We were talking. And I said, oh, did you hear about that on My Favorite Murder? And she was like, I love those girls so much. And I was like, I do too. I listen to them all the time. I love My Favorite Murder. If you, know, if you don't know what it is, My Favorite Murder is a podcast. And it's these two women and they're hilarious together. Absolutely hilarious. And she said, um, yeah, we drive by that house. Oh, I said, did you know that they did a show in Indianapolis? I think they may, they may have done more than one show in Indianapolis. But I was like, did you know that they did a show in Indianapolis? And she was like, yeah. She was like, we drive by that house all the time. She was talking in reference to picking up her uh, son. And she was like, when I have to pick up my son from like this like sporting activity, she was like, we drive by there all the time. And I'm always like, that's where. And she goes, I say, that's where it happened. And I go, oh my God, like, wh why are you way out there? And she was like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, why are you way out there in Carmel? Like, what sporting event is in like that area, right? Or And she's like, no. She's like, it's off of Spring Mill Road. And I go, what? And Spring Mill Road is like pretty close to where I live. It's probably <clears throat> less than 10 minutes away from where I live. And she goes, what are you talking about? I go, the Herb Baumeister case at Fox Hollow Farms. And she goes, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I go, you don't know about Herb Baumeister that killed the 29 gay men? Okay, so this friend of mine, she and I are about the same age. She's a couple years older than me. And um, I actually went to, went to high school with my cousin, but she didn't know my cousin. And so she was like... Um, I think I remember that from like when we would have been in college and stuff. And I go, yeah, that's like when it happened. And she goes, why did they do that on their podcast? She goes, I don't remember that. And I go, yeah, they did it. They talked about it on their podcast. And, um, and I said, and I went out there and did this paranormal investigation and she was like, how was it? And I go, it was, it was really sad actually. And I was telling her all about it and stuff. And she's like, well, do you not know what I'm talking about? And I go, oh, I should have pulled over and read the story to you because I was just looking it up. Because I meant to look it up as soon as I left. And, um, I didn't, so I was just reminded of it. So I was like, I'm going to look tonight. And she was like, there was like this millionaire heiress that lived off of Spring Mill. And she was like killed by these like robbers. And they've like, it's apparently a cold case. They've never felt like they've, they've never solved, I guess, or something. And I go, really? And she goes, yeah. She goes, you didn't know that? I said, no, I have no idea. And she goes, so we're always like driving by there. And I'm always like, that's where that lady was killed. <laughs> Only my friends and I would be like that, right? So I just looked it up, and it's like this huge story here in Indiana, or Indianapolis. This heiress, Marjorie something. I'll read it to you in just a second. I literally just looked up, I looked up Spring Mill Road, murder, Indianapolis, and it like pulled it up right away. And the address is 6490 Spring Mill. So I was like, let's just drive over there. I want to see this house. Which is super close to, like, where I'm usually at. I'm, like, way on the north side. I'm, like, right by Fox Hollow Farms right now. Probably five minutes away from Fox Hollow Farms. And then there was another case that happened in Indianapolis. We might as well tell some spooky stories since it's Halloween month. Um, there was another case of... My friend always wants me to, like, read this book for the book club. Because she's like, oh, my God, you got to read this book for the book club. And the reason that we haven't is because the one that we want to read is not available on Audible or in the library. And so it would be hard for people to get. But it's about this woman here. 
that like kept her daughter or whatever like she adopted this dog she kept her like in a closet and let like all like the neighborhood kids and stuff like do stuff to her and it was like she was it was real sadistic and that apparently happened here like in the 30s or the 40s or something like that and um I think it's called like a mother's something so anyway I'm gonna pull up here and I'm gonna read this article People have asked me to go do, uh, like, more... I should actually do it in my vlog, because the Fox Hollow Farms one, people seem to really like that one. But they're like, could you go do more of, like, these haunted places on your vlog and stuff like that? I would love to do that, but I don't know a lot of them in Indianapolis. Like, and it's not like you can just go to them and just be like, hey, I'm here, I want to come through and see it. It's not like, you know, they're museums or whatever. Um... And when Melissa and Aaron go to, um, like, when they go to, like, Waverly and stuff like that, like, they have to pay, like, a lot of money. Like, it's, like, $200, 250 to go see those things. And then they're in there, and they have to, like, they go out of town for, like, the weekend because, you know, it's far away. And so it's not, like, it's just, like, this one-night thing that they do. There are people that, see, there are people at the gym working out right now. I was talking to my trainer today. She was helping me get motivated to get back at the gym because I haven't been very good about going to the gym lately. I haven't been good about my diet. I haven't been good about going to the gym. I need to get back on track. Okay. Here I am. <laughs> Here I am. There's a gym and Club Pilates right there. I guess that should be a sign, shouldn't it, that I need to be getting back to the gym. Okay, so... 60, 6490. Um, where's the article? Murdered heiress mystery, missing millions and more. Murdered heiress mystery, missing millions and more. You want to see what she looks like? Hold on a second. Here she is. Can you see it? Here she is. Nearly 40 years. When was this written? 2015, September 19th. More nearly 40 years have passed since millionaire rec more than 40 years have passed since a millionaire recluse Marjorie Jackson was murdered during a robbery of her home in the 6400 block of Spring Mill Road. After all that time, questions still linger about the fate of some of the three million or more the killers got away with back in 1977. Loot that was part of an unbelievable cachet Jackson kept hidden three million dollars. In 1977, that would be so much today. Okay, Cache, uh, Jackson kept it. Wait, wait, wait. After all that time, questions still linger about the fate of some of the $3 million or more the killers got away with back in 1977. Loot that was part of an unbelievable cachet Jackson kept hidden around her home after withdrawing about $8.6 million from the bank in the months before her murder. We've always thought there was at least $1.6 million that was never accounted for, said retired Indianapolis Police Captain Steve Kors, a nephew of Jackson and co-executor of her estate. There could be a lot more... Ooh, that's interesting, isn't it? That... Okay. The police investigator on the case is also her nephew. There could be a lot more uh, than that out there. You just don't know. But the 1.6 million we know because of the serial numbers and the amount she withdrew from the bank. Now an 80-year-old... Now an 81-year-old investigative reporter in Arizona has a hunch where at least some of the missing money went, and he thinks the FBI may be hiding key information to protect the reputations of the agency. A deceased former agent he, sus he suspects may have kept some of the loot after arresting one of the suspects. The scenario laid out by Don Devereaux is a doozy for sure. Some will argue it's nothing more than a wild notion. Others will see it as the fitting explanation for a fantastical case that has seemingly defied plausibility at every turn. Central to Devereaux's claims are public records, including real estate and financial documents. I need to lock my door. I'm getting spooked. Okay. Um, central to Devereaux's claims claim are public records including real estate and financial documents as well as an FBI file detailing the Phoenix field office's role in the apprehension of the man later convicted of killing Jackson. I guess it wasn't a closed case or a cold case. Among the FBI records he obtained last year through a Freedom of Information Act request is a notice that the file was partially destroyed in 1993, something Devereaux said he has never encountered in more than 
something Devereaux said he has never encountered in more than 50 previous FQ free FQ oh FOIA Freedom of In Freedom of Information Act requests the FBI the agency so far has not provided any explanation for why that part of the file was destroyed or what the missing documents may have obtained contained Devereaux said he can't help but wonder if those missing pages contained information about the possibility of missing money in the Jackson case and whether the Bureau believed one of its agents might be involved. If his theory seems far-fetched, remember this. So was the tangled series of events that culminated in the summer of 1977 when a pair of FBI agents from Phoenix reported digging up 1.7 million buried under five feet of sand in the desert north of Phoenix. The killing, and then it shows a picture of the house right here. I don't know if you can see that. I hate when I try to show something. There's the house, which we're gonna go try to find here in just a second. The crime, the killing of Jackson because of her eccentric lifestyle and the vast amount of money involved attracted international attention. It was reported at the time as, and may still be the largest cash heist from a residential burglary in US history. The case remains one of the most fabled crimes in Indiana history thanks well, I never knew anything about it. The case remains one of the most fabled crimes in Indiana history thanks to a cast of characters who seem like they jumped out of the script of a Coen Brothers movie. The eccentric grocery chain heiress who kept a table set in anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ, who covered doorknobs and heating vents with aluminum foil and stashed millions of dollars in trash bags, toolboxes, dresser drawers, and garbage cans. A pair of bumbling burglars, one characterized as a small town hick and the other as streetwise city hustler. A sheriff named Diamond Don who wore a jewel studded vest and bragged about his past gambling exploits. Every celebrity lawyer, even celebrity lawyer F. Lee Bailey. Then there was the, then there were the unbelievable, if they hadn't been true, details and plot twists. The, crook, the crooks returned to Jackson's home to cart out even more cash, followed by a bungled attempt to set a fire to cover their tracks. This is unreal. The conspicuous spending sprees in the days after the deadly robbery, the discovery of dozens of neatly wrapped gifts Jackson had left in her home with cards saying they were for Jesus and God, along with an additional five million the thieves had left behind. A flight to Arizona where one of the burglars buried at least 1.7 million in the desert, possibly in response to advice from Bailey. The recovery of that money with the help of a woman who had at least twice married and divorced the suspect. And the speculation that millions of dollars from Jackson's cachet still remain unaccounted, and the speculation that millions of dollars from Jackson's cachet still remain unaccounted for all these years later. Stash of cash. Marjorie Vi Viola O'Connell Jackson's money came from her husband Chester Jackson, a businessman and shrewd investor who amassed a fortune before his death in 1970. Chester Jackson's father, Lafayette Andrew. Lafayette Andrew Jackson founded the standard grocery chain that grew to include more than 250 stores in Indianapolis and other cities around the state. Chester Jackson became the company's president in 1931 after his father was shot and killed during a robbery of a ch chain's flag. We don't even have these stores here anymore. Chain's flagship store in the 400 block of East Washington Street. Jackson sold the chain in 1947 to the National Tea Company, according to the book Notorious 92, Indiana's Most Heinous Murders in All 92 Counties by Andrew E. Stoner. The account says the sale allowed Jackson to buy $14 million in coal stocks, wow, $5 million in municipal bonds, $1 million in cash and treasury bills and other investments. In all, Stoner wrote, the Jackson estate was worth more than $25 million. Chester Jackson was still married to his first wife when he met Marjorie O'Connor, former Indianapolis Star reporter and editor Dick Katie wrote in his book about the case, Scavengers, A True Story of Money, Madison Murder. Katie wrote that Marjorie, who came from a hard scrabble background, was working at a Murphy's Five and Dime store in downtown Indianapolis when they met. The couple carried on a not-so-secret affair for years before Jackson finally obtained a divorce, according to the book. They were married, the second for both, in 1952. Two years later, the couple, who had no children, purchased a home on Spring Mill. So they would have lived there when my mom was in high school, like in junior high and high school. That's weird. Okay. When Chester died in 1970, Major Marjorie Jackson inherited an estimated 14 million, depositing most of the money in the Indiana National Bank. Indiana National Bank. Uh, what few knew of the time, what what few knew at the time was that Chester Jackson, who didn't like the IRS, had for years stashed cash, 
had for a year stashed cash at the couple's home. By some accounts, it may have been more than $2 million, but that was only a pittance compared to what was to come. Marjorie Jackson, who was 60 when her husband died, continued to live at the couple's home, but as years went by, she became more reclusive and allowed the property to grow up in tall grass and weeds. There's a picture of him here, and he's, like, counting money. I don't know if you can see it. I hate when I'm trying to show pictures on here. There he is, and he's counting money. No, I don't need to save the image. Neighbors, what was this? Oh, no, that's Sergeant David Pichel of the Marion County Sheriff's Department counts. $200. $36,000, a small part of the money found at the home of Marjorie Jackson. A woman delivered this portion of the loot to investigators in Kentucky. Neighbors quoted in a news story after her murder said the widow talked to the birds and animals, practiced bizarre religious rituals, spouted racial epithets, and even claimed to grow money out of the ground. She had two new Cadillacs in her garage, including one that she never even bothered to license. In 1976, after a bank employee embezzled $700,000, Jackson began withdrawing her savings. She would show up at the bank and demand $500,000 to a million dollars at a time, taking a stack of $100 bills home in a suitcase or grocery bags. Over the course of about four months, Jackson withdrew everything she had in the bank. The total was nearly $8 million. Oh, my God. She hid the money all around her home in closets, toolboxes, uh, garbage cans, and vacuum cleaner bags. The money was interspersed with an odd collection of gifts from washcloths to cakes to expensive jewelry scattered around the house. The neatly wrapped packages had tags that read to Jesus Christ from Marjorie Jackson and to God from Marjorie. Indianapolis attorney Robert Tommy Thompson, who worked for the prosecutor's office at the time, said bank officials, police, a judge, and a prosecutor all tried to convince Jackson that keeping so much money at home was a risk. It could, they told Jackson, put her life in danger. She told them to mind their own business. <laughs> You guys are probably so bored of this story. I'm sorry, but I'm, like, so intrigued by it. Several months before she was murdered, two teens burglarized Jackson's home. They got away with about $800,000, but she refused to prosecute them, even after one of the thieves confessed to grand jury, to a grand jury. Thompson visited Jackson... That's interesting that she um, refused to prosecute them. Thompson visited Jackson after the theft and found himself staring down the barrel of a pistol. It was one of the coldest days of the year, Thompson recalled, and Jackson greeted him and several lawmen in the driveway of her home dressed only in a nightgown. Jackson denied any money was taken in the recent break-in at her home. When Thompson said one of the crooks admitted to stealing nearly $800,000, Jackson insisted the man was lying. Get off my property, she, get off my property, she instructed Thompson and the others. The next, Thompson, next time Thompson saw Marjorie Jackson was about four months later. This time she was lying dead in a pool of blood on her kitchen floor. The curious case of the robbery and killing of Jackson began to unfold on May 2nd. This is long, sorry. Two, uh, May 2nd, 1977, when an unlikely duo, Howard Billy Joe Willard, 38, Mooresville, Emmanuel Lee Robinson, 29, Indianapolis, broke into Jackson's home. The pair left with about $1 million in cash. They were, according to Indianapolis attorney John Schwartz, M. Schwartz, a fascinating on-couple. You had Ro Robinson, okay, Schwartz, an interview for the story, said he, emboldened by the, uh, Jackson bled to death, surrounded, oh, wait, wait, wait. The pair returned to the Jackson's home two days later. This time they were confronted by the widow and Willard shot her in the stomach with a 22 rifle. Um, Jackson bled to death, surrounded by the scores of gifts, as well as the fine china and cutlery she laid out in her dining room for her anticipated feast with Jesus. The burglars tried to set the home on fire, but the small... I mean, this is so sad and weird at the same time, isn't it? Jackson's body was discovered after the fire was extinguished. And despite Willard and Robinson making a return trip to the home, hauling out bags of cash, mostly $100 bills, the police found they had left millions behind. Exactly how much money Jackson had hidden and how much of that money Willard and Robinson got away with would never be confirmed, said Schwartz, the deputy prosecutor. Okay. There may have been as much as $15 million stashed at Jackson's home. Oh, my God. More than $5 million was recovered after the fire. Okay, men got uh, take long to the men got caught. Buried treasure. This article is forever long. Huh. 
And the sheriff asked Coors to spend the night in his office to keep an eye on the money until it could be put somewhere more safe. I slept on the couch in the office, Coors said, but I'm not sure I slept all that much. And nearly 40 years later, the retired police officer was conflicted by the possibility another lawman would have skimmed some of that money stolen from his aunt. I'm not accusing the FBI of anything he said, but it sounds like there could be something to it. So I think it is something that should be looked into. That was in 2015. Hmm. So let's go find old Marjorie. I want to see this house. That's crazy, isn't it? So sad. So sad and weird at the same time. It just got really cold in here, you guys. That is so strange, isn't it? The house looks like it's kind of like off the street a little bit. way to get there from here. I'm trying to get the fastest way to get there from here. I'm hungry too. <laughs> Just in case you care. You're like, no, we really don't. I'm like, okay. <laughs> There's nothing to eat this late anyway, so I'm screwed. Why does that pasta sound so good to me? Oh, Bricks Pizza. That's what that place is called. It's Bricks with two X's. Sounds so good to me right now. Do you know, like, there's so many people that are fascinated by true crime now. You know, it's interesting when you think about it. It's like, what is it for those of us that are interested in it that makes it intriguing, you know? I was actually, um, so I was reading this. Reddit thread. I look. I looked up this article. I wanted to find out. So Israel Keys, when he died, he's the one that I read the book about. He was a serial killer from Alaska. He had a girlfriend and a daughter at the time that he died. Okay. And when I was watching this show tonight, like I had forgotten about this from the book. Like one of the things that he was really, really focused on was that he didn't want. Like, he didn't want that much known about him because he didn't want his daughter to be able to, like, Google him later and find out all this horrible stuff about him. Which, I mean, obviously she'd be able to do that, right? Um, I think she was, like, 10 at the time of his death, which means she would be, like, 17 now or something. So, when he died in 2012. But he also had a girlfriend at the time that he lived with. And, um... So I was like looking up because I wanted to see if there was any pictures of this girlfriend. I wanted to, you know, and like he's really rather normal looking. Oh, stopped. I was at the end. He was really rather normal looking. It was really like a pretty normal guy other than he had this like really like serious like religious background and that he was like raised in and um, that he was a serial killer. I mean, that's not normal, right? <laughs> but like when you, uh, it was interesting, this one comment, you know, like with all of these, like, you know, like with Shane Dawson, I was thinking about this. He had done that series about Jake Paul and was he like, you know, a sociopath and all this kind of stuff. And this one FBI investigator, it was talking about, uh, Israel Keith said to him, I guess you got your monster. And he goes, you know, he goes, we want to talk a lot in society about sociopaths and psychopaths, but when you're sitting in front of them, like when they're sitting across from you and you're talking to them, he said something about like, it really like tugs at your soul or something. It was like a really interesting comment. Did they just, does it say road closed ahead? Are you kidding me? If I can't get through here, I'm going to be bitter. Um, but... So I was just wanting to see like if his girlfriend had ever come out and made a statement or said anything and whatever. And I do think like with these serial killers, I don't think their families should have to suffer because of the, who they were as people. I really don't, you know, especially not as child. Um, but there was nothing on them. I mean, like there's literally nothing. Although I did think it was interesting. They had a funeral for him and his family went. For, his mom and four sisters went to the, They were really religious people. That was part of the book. Um, 
what was I saying though? Oh, so I was like on this Reddit thread and they were talking about, and I thought like the quote, I had heard the quote was something like a, th like a thousand active serial killers at any given time. But I guess that's incorrect. So at any given time in the United States, there's anywhere from like 30 to 100 active serial killers. And they said like 100 is a really high estimate. Like that's probably way, way high, right? And it's more like 30. And so they were saying, like this Reddit thread was talking about it was something about like, like they found a picture of his car, like his truck, like on Google image search or whatever. And they were saying like, just think about all the times that you like possibly like, well, they were talking about the differences between a murderer and just a serial killer, <laughs> just a serial killer. The difference between a murderer and a serial killer and that it's more prevalent that you would like come in contact with a murderer, like somebody that had murdered somebody once, but that was different than a serial killer, right? But that, think about like how many times just in the public, like going to the gas station or the, you know, the Hardee's or the McDonald's or whatever, how many times like you have come in contact with a murderer or a serial killer? Like the possibility for that is crazy, isn't it? But then they had done like some study to talk about like the probability of how many times in our life that we in, in the United States could have passed a serial killer or a murderer or been like in the same space as them. And they, what it was interesting because one of the questions they, I mean, this was all in a Reddit thread. It wasn't like, you know, deeply researched or anything. But one of the things they said was, but if you lived on the same street as a serial killer, that would totally like up your number. So that would change the statistical ratio, right? Which I thought like that, like that's weird too. Like, can you imagine like if you lived down the street from a serial killer? Like, I mean, I don't like, it's interesting to me that like maybe they have, and if somebody knows of one of these books, I would be very interested to read it. Um, from that point of view, um, of like a neighbor of one of these serial killers, like John Wayne Gacy or something like that. It's interesting to me that you'll hear them come out and talk in interviews and stuff sometimes, but they, like on Israel Keys, when I was like Googling stuff about him, um, like one of his ex coworkers like had done like this interview on him, but it's interesting like, when I think about my neighbors, like, to think that, like, this was going on at, like, three houses down from me, and I never knew, and I'm, like, taking my dogs out for walks at two o'clock in the morning, you know what I mean? Like, and I never thought that way, that, like, there was somebody three houses down. I mean, like, that is crazy. Like, that is crazy, you know what I mean? And that was what they were saying, was that the majority of these serial killers just hide in plain sight. Like, they're right out in the public view, you know, Israel Keys, it, like this was part of the documentary that I was watching, but it was also part of the book. The last girl that he murdered, Samantha Koenig, he like abducted her from this coffee kiosk that was like out there, the, these coffee stands out in the middle of nowhere. He like abducted her and then he took her home and he did all this horrible stuff to her and then he killed her and he rolled her up and put her in this box in this um, shed that he had. And then his girlfriend and daughter left the next day for New Orleans and they went on a cruise for two weeks. And he didn't come back for two weeks. Her body was just there. Like, he went on a cruise. <laughs> and then, I mean, think about all these people that were on this cruise ship with him. And he had just killed this girl and put her in a shed. Like, I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. It makes you really question, like, evil, you know? And the idea of whether or not evil is born or learned. And then my friend was telling me too, she's like, have you read about the Green River Killer? And I was like, no, I think we're gonna do that next year in 2020, because a lot of people ask us to read about it. And she said, did you know that there's a graphic novel about it? I was like, what? She's like, yeah, there's a graphic novel that came out about the Green River Killer. And um, you can like get it. And it's basically like the story told from somebody's point of view, like the, the detective's son or detective's nephew or somebody's uncle or whatever, I don't know, point of view. And he's the one that did the graphic novel. And she said it was really good. So we're gonna have to look into that. We might have to do a graphic novel as part of our reading for uh, 
the book club. I just said I was getting hungry, and it's like, then it like crossed over to this point where I'm like, almost kind of having hunger pains. I wish like everything was open late at night. I know it would be so unhealthy and I'd be 300 pounds heavier than I already am. But, I mean, there's really nothing to get this late at night, you know? There's all these articles coming out now about the Impossible Burger and, and that it's like supposedly like real dangerous for you. Sarah sent me one the other day. She was like, did you see this? And I was like, no. I'm like, of course, the one thing that I like is super dangerous for you. I haven't had any of that Beyond Burger that people talk about too. I think I had it maybe at one restaurant I went to, they had like a Beyond Burger sandwich and I just didn't feel like it was the same. Where did I go? I feel like I talked about that on here not too long ago. Where I went somewhere and I was like, it was okay, but it wasn't as good as the Impossible Burger. Where did I go that I had that Beyond Burger? I feel like it was like a restaurant where I sat down. Oh, I know where it was. It was Champs when I went for um, Horror Hound Weekend with Melissa and Jason. Yeah, it fell apart. It wasn't as good as the Impossible Burger. There's not a whole lot of people out on the roads tonight. going to get up and get some stuff done around the house, make my videos, and then get ready to go to my meeting tomorrow night. Let's see if Tanya wants to go somewhere to eat afterwards. I don't know how back in the day so back in the, did we go before or did we go after? I mean, we must have gone after or before. And we must, okay, so back in the day, we used to go to this restaurant on Tuesday nights before our meeting, and it was called El Camino. If our meeting starts at 8, which we would have had to have left 15 minutes before, so 7.45 to get there in time, and we always got to the meeting early, so we always got to the meeting at like 7.45, which means we would have had to leave there at like 7.30, which means we would have had to get to El Camino at like 6 or 6, 30, 6 o'clock. I don't know how we used to do it back in the day. But I do remember, like, when I worked in treatment, you know, I would get done at 4.30, and I would come home, and then I would, like, take a shower and, like, leave right away. So maybe that's what it is. I would just, like, come home. Yeah, I would come home and just, like, change, and, like, take a shower and, like, change and get ready to go to my meeting. So, because I always feel like I'm rushing now. And we don't go to dinner before. We used to always go to dinner. Tanya always works right up to the point that we have to usually leave too. Like she'll come home and like take a quick shower and then go. But we used to there be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight of us that would go to this Mexican restaurant called El Camino. And we would all sit there at this big table. So fun. Now everybody's doing their own thing. Half those people aren't even sober anymore. Seems so sad. I look at it as a very like pure time of my life, you know? We would go to dinner and then like after dinner, you know, we would go over to Tanya's and Tanya would make a big bonfire and her husband would be inside watching TV and sometimes like my ex would come over and he would like, you know, sit out there with us and, you know, like my, my friend, her girlfriend would come over and, you know, it'd be like a big group of people and Tanya's husband would come in and out and, you know, and he'd sit down for a little bit and talk to us and, 
it was just fun, you know, we'd all like, then somebody would want a fountain coke, and we'd run and get a fountain pop, a couple of us, and come back, and we'd stay there till 12 or 1, and go home, it was just like a really pure time of my life, you know, it's not like a really a whole lot different than my life is now, except it's just Tanya and I, well, we have like this, you know, my sponsor, and like one other friend, but, um, that was like just a really, it was a good time, you know, like, my life was really go to work, go out to dinner with my ex, you know, or get food and eat it at home, go to the meeting, hang out with my friends that were, like, my sober friends three nights a week, something like that, you know, and then on the weekends we go to a casino or we go to Seymour and visit, you know, our friends down there or whatever. It's simple. I guess my life is kind of like that now, but I just don't... Like, my friends that I go to meetings with and stuff like that, like, they all have, like, you know what I mean? It's been a while, so, like, they all have, like, very professional jobs, or their kids, they, they've now since got married and had kids, you know, or whatever, and so, like, they're in relationships, so it's harder, you know? And it's, like, kind of just Tanya and I, here and I, here I am coming on to Spring Mill Road, right here. Are you ready? Oh, my God! So I'm at 82nd in Spring Mill Road right now, or 86 in the Spring Mill Road right now. I always forget where it switches. 86 just turns into 82nd at some point. I always forget where that happens. So I don't know what side of the street it'll be on. Let's see. Oh my God, I can't see. I think that said 8511 over there. I'm gonna see what the address is. 8427. 8422. How is that? 8417. How is like odd, odd and even on the same side? That's weird, isn't it? You guys, I'm getting spooked. 8217. 8308. Why is it going the other direction? When I'm going south. You should see some of these houses. Some of these houses are amazing. And here is like where some of like, like their estates, like some of the wealthiest people in Indianapolis. Now this house, I've seen the picture of the house on the article, it's not like that. But this is like right here, like you can't even see it, like it goes way off the road. This is where like some of the, the wealthiest people in Indianapolis lived back in the day. Like these are like huge estates. And now people are buying them and they're redoing them. They're like compound estates, like huge. Peyton Manning, the uh, Colts player, he used to live right here. You can't hear, I'll show you. You can see kind of. He used to live right over here. And then you can see these houses have like secured entrances and then you can't even see, like you can't, they're like gated and stuff. Thank you. 
reading that article, there were several books that had um, been written about this. I'd be interested to find out a little bit more about it. Since I only found out about it today, now I'm already doing all this. Oh, you guys, look, they have, you can't see it really, but they have Halloween decorations right there. All from uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas. How cute is that? And they had a big clown in the. I just cannot ever get the temperature right in here. Okay, I'm getting close. I'm at 70, 42. I'm getting nervous. Are you nervous? You guys were like, no. There will be somebody out there that will be like, I don't like the scary one that you talk like when you do the scary ones. <laughs> Sixty six oh six. Okay, we're coming up on it. I'm gonna probably have to turn around at some point because I wonder what side it's on. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, it's gotta be on. It's gotta be on this side. Sixty four twenty. Sixty five twenty. Sixty five twenty. 6510. So it's got to be the next one. I'm rolling out my window. Is this it right here? This is it. Oh my God. That's it. Oh shit. That's spooky. Yep. Because across the street is 6487. Oh, how would you live in there? Well, I'll tell you how you would live in there. You would probably think that some of that money is still in there, wouldn't you? That's 6470. Yep, that was it. That had to have been it. I'm gonna turn around and go back. I'm gonna see it again. You guys live in a house where somebody was killed. I just could not do it. I mean, I, I thought a lot about that since we went to like the Baumeister thing. I just don't think that I could do it. This is like my mom's old stomping ground when she was in high school. <laughs> so worked up with this stuff. <sighs> well, that was something I didn't expect I'd be doing tonight on here when I started this. scared like that why I do that so anyway well that concludes tonight's tour of uh, murder house God and um, I think I'm gonna get off here now <laughs> I will be back tomorrow who knows what fun and excitement will await us then 
I hope you guys are having a I hope you guys are having an amazing Tuesday unless you have other plans but like I always say do not have other plans make the most of your day life is oh look there's the haunted house there's the Halloween houses like you can see see there's like but like I always say life is not a dress rehearsal well, this is not a dress rehearsal. Make the most of your day. Enjoy it. Do something fun. Do something that you will look back on and be happy that you did. And, um, yeah. Take some risks today. Some positive risks for yourself. And, um, if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. Make sure that you look at yourself in the mirror every single day and say, I love you. You are important. You are valuable. You are valuable and that you believe it. Do daily affirmations every single day and make your gratitude lists. And most importantly, make sure that you let somebody else know how important they are to you. And my camera is all out of focus. And um, I love you guys and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya.